Uh, I don't know whether I'm supposed to push any buttons here or anything, but uh, I'll wait for something to happen. How do we get... Uh, anyway, I'll, I'll do my introductory <laughs> comments. Uh, first of all, I am absolutely okay, delighted... First of all, if anybody's going to have an epileptic seizure, this is the time <laughs> to have it. I, I don't like people doing that in the middle of my uh, performance. Um, but it, for me, it is a great thrill to be here. Uh, and these are my friends. As John said, we've known each other fairly well since, uh, 1970, since 1995. Sorry, uh, And we are like family. I don't mean family in the New Jersey sense of the word. But uh, we do know each other very well. And uh, have come to, if I say love each other, you know what I mean. Uh, I just want to mention that one of our members is up, currently up before the General Medical Council in the United States, uh, sorry, in England. I refer, of course, to Dr. Andrew Wakefield, whose defence started uh, this last week. And as far as I can see, it's all going rather well. Uh, we <laughs> and perhaps I can pass on good wishes from the meeting to him. Um, the next thing I want to say is that um, this doesn't work. Oh no, the wrong button. <laughs> wrong button. Yes. Press escape and then you can use the up or down. Are you trying to use the pointer? No, it doesn't work. There we go. Okay. So I've flown in uh, from London a couple of days ago and I went to the United Nations meeting uh, on Wednesday and I was allowed a few seconds to speak. Um, but one of the things is, it's quite clear, is that Dan type groups are springing up all over the world. Uh, and the Dan Nigeria movement had a big march with government officials, the presidents, and all this sort of thing. It is spreading its wings. Uh, my wife has let me come here. Um, those of you who see me will recognize that it's the same jacket and it's now too big. Um, and that's one of the things I did. I went gluten-free, and it's made quite a bit of difference to my health. Um, and that's what I'm talking about today. That's just to remind me to keep me on track. Uh, when I was here last year, the National Institute of Health made an announcement. They're going to invest huge amounts of money uh, looking at environmental factors in triggering autism, which was excellent news, uh, listening to what's uh, going on. At the same time, I was w sweating on the results of a trial that was going on in Malmo in Sweden, where the insurance companies were claiming that autism was 100% genetic, and therefore they didn't have to pay the parents for this. Unfortunately, we lost that case. So in Sweden, uh, autism is 100% genetic, but the rest of the world accepts that there are environmental factors involved. Um, there are many chemicals which could be implicated in this story, and there's a list of some of them, dioxins, PCBs, bisphenols, uh, which are used in uh, tooth uh, enamel repair jobs. And I wanted to mention that one. I was a bit concerned about this, so I pulled one of my caps off my teeth uh, last night. So if I speak in a particularly strange way, um, that's why it is. I'm trying to save my, save my health. Um, <laughs> the other thing is that during the evaluations, there's somebody who doesn't like me, and every year he puts something about speaking in his stupid English accent. I'm sorry, I can't help that, but... <laughs> But if that person would leave now, it would make, it, make us all very happy. I also want to point out that mercury has now been completely banned from amalgam. Amalgam fillings are now banned in the Scandinavian countries. Um, as from April the 1st, Sweden was the last, they've just gone. Um, so why are we pointing a particular finger of suspicion at insecticides, and in particular organophosphorus pesticides? And... Uh, uh, I have written this up in a magazine, very illustrious magazine, The Autism File, uh, which Jonathan Tommy is one of the co-founders and editors of here. And this has a circulation of about 8,000 in the United Kingdom. Uh, you can buy it in bookstores. Book and the next edition, the print run, I think is 20,000. So it's actually doing spectacularly well. And we put an article in there, a parent-friendly version of this. If anybody wants it, I can email it to you. He, he's given me the permission to do this to you. Uh, so a lot of what I say is in there. Uh, this is what a poem John Pangborn likes, a bit of chemistry for you. A mosquito was heard to complain that a chemist had injured his brain. The cause of his sorrow was paradichlorodiphenyltrichloroethane. 
which you will now know is actually DDT, as John has explained. Um, now, this was banned, these old organochlorine pesticides were banned throughout Europe between 1979 and 1990, uh, 1982 and replaced with organophosphorus pesticides. And that's what appeared to happen, year of birth along the bottom there. And the drop off isn't because the numbers have dropped off, just these hadn't been diagnosed. So that's when the period of time when organophosphates replaced the older adder organochlorines. Now that doesn't prove very much, as John said. For example, in 1979, ABBA won the Eurovision Song Contest. <laughs> now, I'm not blaming ABBA for the autism outbreak. So the point I'm trying to make is it proves nothing, but it is just has to be borne in mind that autism and many other disorders sort of appeared around that time. There's other circumstantial evidence. In our surveys, we get higher levels of autism in rural areas than in urban areas. Uh, and the study that John alluded to earlier, the Roberts study, where they looked at but where parents' mothers were living at the time their autistic children or their children were developing and they found elevated levels the closer you lived to the field where it was being sprayed and the timing was critical. If the, if the new relation was taking place at the time spraying occurred, there was a greater problem as well. Now this is not me, this is not the University of Sunderland saying that, this is the NIH saying that. You've got to listen. Um, you might be interested to know that endosulfan, one of the culprits here, has been banned throughout most of Europe uh, and I was shocked to see that it was still being used in the United States. Uh, you see, it's gone, virtually gone. Um, there are certain specific uses which can still be used and I would suggest that alternatives should be found here as well. Other circumstantial evidence. Uh, we know that some children behave, behavior deteriorates when they have things put on their hair for nits, for lice. We see that quite commonly. Some children go funny at certain times of the year, we understand. And people are sprayed accidentally with the aeroplanes and they have problems as well. And there's a lot of evidence, anecdotal evidence, which we have not yet tested experimentally, but we will do in the next year or so, uh, for the effectiveness of anecdot anecdotal evidence. It's purely anecdotal for the effectiveness of organic diets and it is plausible. I now want to show you some of the evidence uh, for this. This goes back a very long time. We've been doing HPLCs of looking at people with autism and comparing them at the urine samples from other people for many, many years. And the top graph there represents a mixed sample of 20 people with autism. The big peak on the right-hand side there uh, is actually the preservative, but the one on the left is the one we were interested in. We didn't know what it meant, and the one at the bottom is controlled 20 mixed samples from people with uh, urine with asymptomatic people, and the difference is quite spectacular. That is why we focused on what is that substance there, and it took us a long time to work it out because we didn't have the equipment to do so. But in 1986, it was as blatant as that. There was a difference between the two uh, groups. They also got ele elevated levels of this substance, which we now know to be IAG, indoloral acryl glycine, a metabolite of tryptophan, which I'll come on into in a minute. We also found elevated levels in people with disorders related to autism, ADHD, dyslexia, dyspraxia, and I would add in chronic fatigue syndromes there as well and subjects with Gulf War Syndrome. Quite clearly that compound was elevated and subjects with what we call sheep dipper syndrome, and I think you call it free fruit picker syndrome or something like that, been exposed to, organo to pesticides anyway. So there's a commonality there. And we published the structure in peer-reviewed journals at that time and we also published to show the levels were higher in people with autism than in the control populations. It's all out there in the peer-reviewed journals. It suggests that it, that it is higher uh, in this group with other people than other groups. 